Fatik Zubinsky. Welcome to Occupy Brooklyn TV. On today's show, we'll take a look at two of the many working groups of Occupy Wall Street, Occupy Faith and Strike Debt. On Saturday, October 13th, people in at least 20 cities around the world gathered to protest debt in all its forms. The day of action was called Global Noise, and activists beat pots and pans in the protest tactic known as casserole. Here in New York, about 300 occupiers gathered in Columbus Circle to speak out about debt, and then proceeded on a confrontational march along the haunts of the 1%. The home of Goldman Sachs CEO Lloyd Blankfein was among the places occupiers took the noisy message. Police used nightsticks to repel protesters and independent media, but made no arrests. Leading the march was the working group Strike Debt. Lately, the group and its message of debt resistance have come to prominence in the movement. We wanted to know more about Strike Debt, so we spoke with two of its organizers here in New York. We actually decided to call the group Strike Debt, not Debt Strike. Our goal is to uh, abolish debt, uh, all forms of debt. It's a noun, <laughs> you know. Uh, so strike debt was more um, a call for action, right? So, but also, you know, there are different ways to strike debt, not just in a debt strike. Student debt, medical debt. Seventy-six percent of Americans are debtors. Uh, payday loans. Student debt hit uh, one trillion in April. Housing debts. Five million homes have already been foreclosed and another five million are in default or about to be foreclosed. Debt um, you know, predates all of these other financial instruments and is the, the basic way in which we are oppressed by, by Wall Street and by, by capital. What became evident is that, you know, it's impossible that all of us at the same time just messed up. Um, you know, there is a larger system behind it, a system that pushes people into debt and that profits. You have to go into debt to go to school for the most part. You have to go into debt um, to have an apartment <laughs> um, because you have to have a credit score um, in order to, to have an apartment and to get certain kinds of jobs. Um, so the whole system is designed, you know, so that you have to go into debt in order to prove that you're uh, an upstanding member of society and to have the benefits that go along with that. Um, but of course, when you do that, you take on certain risks um, and you become more and more dependent on the financial system. Debt is what binds 99%. Uh, we all did a debt burning um, in which we gathered at um, East River State Park in Williamsburg and burned uh, our credit debt, our student loans, uh, medical debt, and told stories about how, how we were affected by it. And I was born seeing something I didn't want to have. But I was also born poor, which meant that I knew how to be poor. So I spent most of my life saying, I will never get in debt. I will not take their chains. I'll take a lot of chains getting locked up as a teenager. That was one of my chains. And that made it very difficult for me to get gainful employment throughout my life. So I said, I can still avoid this debt. I can still avoid this debt. And how did I avoid it? I said I was willing to go hungry. I was willing to go homeless. I was willing to, to drop out of school when my full scholarship was gone. I was willing to give up on anything but not allow myself to get in more chains and more bondage to this capitalist system that has kept my people, my, my country Panama, and the rest of the world in debt and in bondage. And I woke up in the hospital about 10 hours later and I was freaked the fuck out, not by the bruises, not by the open head wound, not by the staples in my head, not by the blood or the vomit or anything else. I was freaked out because I was in a hospital. I can't get health insurance. I can't, I have struggled to get Medicaid for years. They lose my paperwork or they say I got a criminal background or they say that they can't find my address because I don't have an, a, an address sometimes. So in the end, I woke up and, and the, the nurse there, he was very nice, but he said to me, he said, don't worry, it's only going to be 400 bucks and they're not even going to come after you. And I left and I, and I was like, okay, I'm a little bit more comfortable. But I was still drunk and I was still pissed off and I had had a concussion. So I said, I got to get the hell out of here. And I ripped off the, 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 all the stuff on me and I, walked, I changed back into my clothes secretly and I snuck out that hospital. And I eventually got to the corner and I found that my glasses, I, I, it was just like a carcass of glasses. The glass was gone. So I had to figure out new glasses at that time. 
And a little while later, I got my $8,500 collection notice. And I've been getting them for a couple years ever since. I'm not going to say where it's from because I want a little bit of privacy. But this is a kind of bondage that I ran from for 28 years. And eventually it caught up. Capitalism always catches up until we take power. <laughs> paycheck to paycheck and paying off those student loan bills every month and it wasn't that bad. It wasn't that bad until I got sick. And at 24 I went to the hospital for what we thought was appendicitis and it turned out to be a genetic blood disorder that I will have for the rest of my life and could kill me. And it took over a year to get diagnosed. So that was a year of going to hospitals and going to doctors two or three times a week and having them tell you things like, you might have a brain tumor come back. You know, this could be lupus, you have to come back. So when you're at that point, you don't say no, because you don't know what's happening and you really could die. And the longer this went on, the more money I was paying. And I had health insurance, but I had to pay co-pays. And when you go to a doctor three or four times a week, that's about my rent payment at some points. And there were certain times I couldn't go to doctors because I couldn't afford to go. And so I very quickly went from, I'm doing really good to, I'm putting my doctor bills on my credit card and I'm putting my groceries on my credit card. And my husband and I started having discussions like, which one of us is gonna eat lunch this week? Because we don't have any more money. And it was really, the, the hardest thing was going up to pay the doctor to pay the copay and trying to figure out, can I pay him with real money? No, I can't pay him with real money because I have this student debt payment that's gonna go this week. So I have to pay him with a credit card. So now I owe him even more money. And I got three jobs at one point and I started making money again because I had three jobs and it was great until my health started going downhill again. And I had to quit two of the jobs because I just physically couldn't keep doing it. So now I'm at this point where I feel like I'm either gonna have a choice if I can be kind of healthy and broke, or I can be financially secure and really sick. And it's, it's hard because I don't really see a sustainable future in this. You know, and this is my life. We believe that um, debt is not simply um, a personal problem and a personal um, responsibility, that it is a structural issue of social justice. We're forced to, to incur these debts that we can't possibly pay, um, and then the people that can pay um, incur astronomical amounts of debt, um, and they never pay. <laughs> um, they're, they're bailed out. We're not, you know, we don't get bailed out. Um, so this is an unjust situation, and we're just saying that we can't possibly pay, and we're not going to. We don't owe the financial establishment of the world anything. Uh, we don't owe Wall Street anything. You know, hypothetically, we were asking people to actually go on a, on a debt strike or to refuse to pay the debt, that it's important to give people alternatives, right, and to create support networks. I mean, also keeping in mind that so many of us are already defaulters. So that, you know, since, you know, the 1% is obviously not gonna, you know, take care of that because they actually profit of that, then, then we need to support one another. So as part of that, we worked on the um, Debt Resistance Operations Manual, um, which was published um, recently, actually a month ago. And uh, um, so it deals with various types of debt. It's, it, um, you know, its goal was to explain where the debt comes from, why it's there, who profits of it, but also to give people advice in terms of what they can do if, you know, if they can't have debt, if they can't pay it, if they are defaulting. The second um, project that's, um, you know, currently active is um, the Rolling Jubilee. We're hoping um, to create 
a network of resistors that would liberate each other from debt by buying defaulted debt pennies on a dollar and then just abolish it. There are various aspects of that. So for example, um, municipal debt is one of them. And that is, you know, that is something that affects everyone, whether, you know, whether you, you are uh, personally in debt or not. So, you know, so many cities, New York, Chicago, Oakland, um, are drowning in municipal debt. And, you know, the result is cuts um, to public funding and, you know, public schools closing and austerity measures, you know, and the same thing is happening, you know, on an international level. Occupy University is currently doing um, a series on debt. So we're really trying to just you know, like open discussion about debt, because I think um, it's really important for people not to feel alone with this problem. And especially since debt is so associated with shame and it's so seen um, as a question of personal responsibility and personal failure that, you know, people, people are really reluctant to talk about it because they feel alone. And so we were ho we are hoping that with these discussions we can really bring people together to share their problems and also to come up with um, alternatives together. Ultimately, the goal um, the goal is to, um, to disassociate altogether, to withdraw from the existing financial system, to withdraw our consent from that system. It's a new kind of general strike. That feels good. I gotta tell you, <laughs> watching my debt burn away like that does feel. Occupy Faith has been with the movement since its beginning. We spoke with three members of this association of clergy, as well as journalist Nathan Schneider, a member of Occupy Catholics. Um, I think the relationship between Faith and Occupy is a lot closer than a lot of people recognize or realize. Um, actually, the first time that I showed up at Occupy Wall Street on September 17, 2011, the first thing I saw was a group of protest chaplains in white robes um, singing, um, holding signs uh, in front of Wall Street at the entrance at Broadway. Um, and so for me, from the very beginning, that presence was there. Um, and throughout the early days of the movement, there were interesting ways that, uh, that religious ideas and language would start to come in. I think for everybody there, this was a kind of transcendent experience and something that people were often kind of grasping at at the language and um, and traditions of, of faith to to process and to understand um, and and you, you saw meditation circles especially at moments of high tension you know when it felt like maybe there might be a police attack or something like that um, and uh, then you just had these kind of like sudden outbursts of, um, you know, of prayer or of some kind of religious expression. Um, and then sometimes I think the spirituality was present even when it wasn't taking any kind of traditional spiritual form. Um, there was still some sense that this is, um, that this was a spiritual experience. When I went to Zuccotti Park, uh, if I'm not mistaken, it was on a Sunday. And um, I didn't even know there was going to be any sort of interfaith prayer service when I went there. I just wanted to check it out. And uh, as I'm standing there, I see uh, a golden uh, bull. And uh, it, was, it, it was a replica or it represented the golden calf and it was uh, also made to look like the Wall Street bull. And this was being carried aloft uh, by clergy. And uh, they, they made their way uh, toward the center of the park and uh, there was an interfaith prayer service. Uh, and, and people spoke and there were prayers and um, that really excited me. I wanted to know who these people were. And eventually I found out that they were Occupy Faith. And I made contact with uh, Michael Ellick. Uh, he and I have since become friends. He is, if, he, I believe his title is the Associate Minister uh, at Judson Memorial Church. 
And that's how I got involved with Occupy Faith. I think it must have been in December when there was a meeting of the Elders Council and they had this beautiful talk back about lessons that they had learned and it was at Judson Memorial Church. Um, and I went to that and then went to the program um, down at Ducati or Liberty Square, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> it was the first time I had heard the mention of faith or God or um, sort of like a moral purpose. And it was really inspiring and it uh, made me realize maybe I do have a place in this movement. So um, I met quite a few people actually that day and uh, who were in different capacities involved in their faith communities and I wanted to keep going back because of them. Um, so that's really where I first got involved. Um, I met with um, Michael Alec from Judson Memorial um, and he started telling me more about uh, Occupy Faith, the work they do. Um, I started talking to him probably about every week or every other week or so just sort of about what's happening in the movement. Um, but our conversations were always based in there's, uh, there's a history um, which was missing from Occupy generally and there is a deeper purpose and um, and that for me made it more real and more tangible and more purposeful it wasn't just um, a release of energy <laughs> so um, that's sort of where I started and there's a sense that I saw that was really striking to me that even these people who don't go to church who who don't think of themselves as religious had a sense of what they thought a church should be and I actually found that I resonated more with what these people were wanting a church to be than with what churches actually tend to be. They wanted it to be a place of radical hospitality and of openness and um, of willingness to um, take a stand against an unjust society. Um, so rarely are our churches actually doing that, um, but that's what they're supposed to be doing. And so I felt like I learned a lot about what a church should be from people in the Occupy movement. Um, actually, from the very beginning, in the early weeks of the movement, um, going to church for me, I go every Sunday pretty much, um, was harder than ever. Um, and the reason was that I had been in a space, I was spending all day in spaces where, um, where every voice was supposed to be heard and where through the General Assembly and so many other features of the movement, there was always an effort made to make sure that as many voices as possible were being listened to and that, um, and that we were um, reflecting our own diversity. And then I would go to church on Sunday and only hearing from the priest um, in the sermon or you know, in the prayers um, just started grating at me more than it normally does. I wanted to know uh, what all the people around me thought of the gospel reading that day rather than just this one person. Um, and, and, and so that sense, that, that, that need that the movement had instilled in me you know, became something that drove me to want to, um, to bring elements of this movement to our church and to start thinking about ways um, that we as a church can you know, reflect some of the, I think, really universal human values and needs that the movement has um, has brought forward and reminded us of. Episcopal Bishop George Packard is best known in Occupy circles for leading the climb over the fence onto land owned by Trinity Wall Street in the infamous D-17 action. I wasn't planning on jumping any fence. I mean, I'm 68 years old. I was thinking, I thought, well, I thought we kind of walked through. I wasn't quite sure what, they plunked this ladder down in front of me. And I've learned in Airborne Ranger School that when they plunk something down, you, you, if, you're at the, if you're the first one at the door, you get on the ladder and you get, you get over the top. And so I thought that, you know, that's what I do. Little did I know that as I jumped over, I began, this cassock would hang on the top of the cyclone fence and I'd be dangling there like a wounded bird. So it wasn't a very graceful entrance. <laughs> well, I, when I read the book um, uh, Leaders, Leaderless Revolution by Connie Ross, uh, it was like the scales uh, fell off my eyes. I thought to myself, uh, this, this is, he's on to something. And I also heard uh, Marissa Eggerstrom uh, from Occupy Boston, uh, a, um, 
another minister who uh, uh, shared this uh, with me, uh, that the only the thing that we, we have is to kind of put our, ourselves into space. We have no other agency or power left, to, really, other than putting our, our own physical bodies in space. And so in that sense, a space that was cordoned off and separated from us is now liberated, so to speak. It's liberated for any possibility. And the possibility for me as a person of, of faith, a spiritual person, is that people can be quickened by the, the presence of each other. They can discover each other. S space is space, but the, the space that's liberated is the space where people enter in, and this is where Occupy Faith has been so spending a lot of time lingering on this on this idea of, of, of spending time talking about each other's stories and we we, we perceive in the in the early um zakati encampment there this is what part of what happened people you know they woke up in the morning brushing their teeth seeing each other they discovered each other in space and, and sharing each other's story so when you share story whether you're online waiting for the radiation treatment or whether you're uh, in the encampment or whether you're um, in the middle of a piece of civil disobedience, you connect with um, brothers and sisters and you do, you're doing something important that's greater than yourself. I started um, getting involved with a People's Investigation, which is a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. So we have weekly, um, actually bi-weekly meetings now. And um, right now we're trying to put these pieces together. And what I like about this is that it's deliberate. Um, it's not about a flash in the pan or how quickly can we get some action out on the street. It's not about spectacle. It's about really honoring people's histories and their stories. And faith traditions are deeply rooted in that. Um, most faith traditions, I think, are um, passed on through story um, before they are through any other means. And so we know how it works. <laughs> and it's worked for generations. And so I think that's, for me, a way that I want to continue um, being part of this movement is collecting and sharing stories. We asked our interviewees what issue they considered most important. Nearly all of them had the same answer. Is supporting the strike debt campaign. Debt uh, really <laughs> takes all these themes and weaves them together. Get rid of the sense of shame or guilt that people have thinking about um, debt or foreclosure. Um, we're actually not even referring to it as foreclosure. It's a violent seizure of people's homes. So like being really real about what is actually happening. And one feature of, um, of Catholic tradition, especially historically, uh, especially in the Middle Ages, was um, a very, very well articulated um, opposition to predatory lending, um, to usury. And this is the kind of thing that you never hear about anymore. Um, but hundreds of years ago, uh, usury was, um, was almost the worst thing imaginable. Um, it, uh, in, in Catholic social thought, that it was recognized that, that um, certain kinds of lending could essentially enslave a person. And unfortunately today we hear this very little, but we in Occupy Catholics have been interested in trying to revive some of that tradition in order to bring, um, to, in order to strengthen the Occupy movement's efforts to change our national discourse about debt um, and uh, and about and about lending, and to um, and to make it a moral discourse again, as it once was, um, and giving people space to actually unload whatever's been on their shoulders. Um, I sort of kind of think back to the days when I was in Catholic school, and we'd have um, confession, <laughs> and in a way, it's sort of like confession, but it's shared. It's something that you don't have to like go say your hail marys and then. Um, hide it from the rest of the world. It's something that we are recognizing is this is wrong, this is why it's wrong, and we have a shared experience. Um, so the idea is to collect stories through multiple means, um, but also use the idea of collecting stories to energize communities themselves. Um, so for example, if I went to my mosque and I said, let's share our stories about this one topic, um, it's a way of strengthening the bonds of brotherhood and sisterhood there. But um, at the same time, it's also about um, recognizing what our history is, not forgetting it, and then um, charting a path for ourselves based on what our perspective is. So that's the idea. Zuccotti Park was actually like the church, 
And when the church burnt down, all those people were like, where do we go? What do we do? And as faith organizers and faith leaders, we knew what we do. You know, like you congregate, you serve coffee, you bring people together, you share stories. But for a lot of people who maybe their first, um, their first encounter with faith and a faith-based community, whether it means that you believe in God or not or something else, you might believe in an idea, but it's still faith. Um, they never experienced their church burning down and they didn't know how to react and it was mayhem. Um, and that was another thing that gave me a little bit of pride of being from a faith-based community. Like we've handled this. Um, even in the last week, like how many mosques have been torched or bombed or vandalized and you don't hear about it in the mainstream media. Um, but we know how to react. We know how to pull together. That's our show for today. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed it and I hope you'll show your appreciation by getting in touch. We'd love to hear what you think about the show, and we could really use your help. It takes a lot of work to keep the show on the air week after week, and a lot of this work can be done from your home computer. So get in touch, give us a call, or send an email with the information on your screen, and we'll let you know how to tap in. I'm Atik Zabinski. Thanks so much for watching.